Hi everybody, welcome to our module on pulmonary anatomy. The respiratory tract is everything from the nose all the way down to the bottom of the lungs, but when we talk about it, we often talk about an upper respiratory tract and a lower respiratory tract. So what do we mean by those things? Well, the upper respiratory tract is the nasal cavity and the pharynx and the larynx. And you often hear people say that a patient has something called a URI, and they mean an upper respiratory infection. Usually they mean a sore throat, but they may also mean sinusitis. They mean an infection that does not involve the lower respiratory tract. Lower respiratory tract includes the trachea, the pulmonary bronchi, and the lungs. We don't often refer to things as a lower respiratory tract infection, although sometimes people do. Usually they say that the patient has bronchitis or pneumonia. You can also divide the respiratory tract into a conducting and a respiratory zone. So the conducting zone conducts air. There's no gas exchange here. These are the large airways like the nose and the pharynx and the trachea and the bronchi. And this portion of the respiratory tract filters and warms the air and humidifies the air. The other zone is the respiratory zone, and that's where gas exchange occurs. So this is way down in the lungs. These are the very small respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar ducts and the alveoli. And this is just another way to talk about the different components of the respiratory tract. So any of you that have ever coughed up phlegm when you have a cold know what mucus is. And mucus are secretions that are produced by the respiratory tract. They're mostly glycoproteins in water. And they're secreted by cells called goblet cells in the walls of the bronchi. And the purpose of mucus is to protect against particulates. Particulates collect in the mucus so they don't get further down in the lungs. They also serve as a barrier to infection. It makes it harder for bacteria and other infectious agents to move down into the lungs. And there are beating cilia that move the mucus up to the epiglottis and then you swallow it. And this is actually actually going on to a small degree all the time, it gets much more significant when you have an infection. Now let's talk about the alveoli. These are small sacs way down in the lungs after the respiratory tract has branched and branched and branched to its smallest level. And this is where gas exchange occurs. And they look sort of like a bunch of grapes, like in this picture up here on the top right. And they're surrounded by capillary beds so that the air can exchange with the blood. And down here on the bottom right is a picture. You've got blood coming in and it releases CO2 into the alveoli and it picks up oxygen with the red blood cells and then carries it out to the heart and the rest of the body. So the cells that line the alveoli are called pneumocytes, and there are two types. The first type are the type 1 cells, and these are the most abundant. 97% of the alveolar cells are type 1, and they're very thin so that gas exchange can occur across those cells. The type 2 cells have a very important function. They produce surfactant, which we'll talk about in a minute, and these are cells that can proliferate to become other cells, so they're very important for regeneration after injury. So it's very high yield to know that the type 2 cells make the surfactant and that they regenerate the lungs in response to injury. A third type of cell I'll mention here is called the clara cells. These aren't really in the alveoli, they're in the terminal bronchioles. Their role is not entirely clear, but they do make a type of surfactant that's different from the surfactant in the alveoli. They also proliferate in response to toxins, so it's thought that they play a role in detoxification. So now let's talk about surfactant. When you exhale, the alveoli shrink. And you can just picture a balloon. As the air goes out of a balloon, that balloon shrinks. And something similar is going on inside the alveoli. If they shrunk enough, they could collapse. And when the alveoli collapse, we call that atelectasis. And this is very inefficient for gas exchange. To collapse, alveoli can't deliver oxygen to the blood and can't pick up carbon dioxide. Furthermore, if the alveoli were to collapse each time you inhale, you'd have to completely re-expand them, and that would take a lot more energy and pressure. So the way the body avoids collapse of alveoli is by producing surfactant. This allows them to stay open when you exhale and avoid collapsing. So in order to understand a little bit more about how surfactant helps the lungs keep the alveoli open, we need to review the law of Laplace. And this is the law of Laplace as it applies to a sphere. It says that the distending pressure to keep a sphere open equals 2 times the surface tension divided by the radius. So if the pressure inside a sphere fell below this distending pressure, the sphere would collapse. So in order to understand this better, let's consider two spheres. One of them is large, and the other one is small. Now the radius of this large sphere obviously is bigger than the radius of the small sphere. So let's talk about what that means for the distending pressure. This radius value is low for the small sphere, which means the distending pressure for the small sphere is high. That means it takes more pressure to keep the small sphere open than it does the big one. It also means that the small sphere is more likely to collapse. It's easy to get under that very high distending pressure of the small sphere and make it collapse. So I've cleared the screen and let's talk about what this means for the alveoli. So when you inhale, the alveoli get large, just like that large sphere. When you exhale, they get small. 
This means that as you're blowing air out of your lungs, the alveoli are going to a state where the pressure required to keep them open is rising. This is a big problem. Air is leaving the lungs right at the time when the lungs need that air to stay inside to keep the pressure up so they don't collapse. So the way the lungs prevent the collapse is through the use of surfactant. Surfactant changes the surface tension number up here in this equation. What surfactant is going to do is as the radius number falls, as the alveoli shrink, the surface tension is also going to fall and this is going to offset any change in distending pressure that might occur by the change in size. So how does that surface tension number change as you go from a big alveoli to a small alveoli? Well, the surface tension is dependent on the concentration of surfactant. And when you exhale, those surfactant molecules get very close together, so the concentration of surfactant actually goes up when you exhale. This makes the surface tension go lower as the alveoli shrink. And so once again, as the surface tension falls, the radius is also falling, and therefore the two effects offset themselves. So key points here are that the smaller alveoli take more pressure to keep them open. They're more likely to collapse, but this is avoided by production of surfactant by the type 2 alveolar cells. Those lower the surface tension to offset the effect of the radius shrinking when you exhale. So remember what I said before, surfactant is secreted by type 2 pneumocytes, and it's very high yield to remember that. It's a mix of chemicals called lecithins, especially one called dipalmatyl phosphatidylcholine. And that's a mouthful, but if you ever see a big word like this, they're probably talking about one of the substances that makes up surfactants. And the most important clinical application of surfactant is in fetal lung maturity. So the lungs in the developing fetus are mature when there's enough surfactant present to keep the alveoli open. If the baby is born before that, it won't be able to breathe because there's no surfactant and all those alveoli will collapse. The lungs mature around 35 weeks, and when this happens, something called the lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio increases. Both of these substances are produced equally by the baby until about 35 weeks. But at around 35 weeks, the ratio becomes greater than 2 in the amniotic fluid. And you can take a sample of the amniotic fluid and test it. And if that ratio is greater than 2, this suggests the lungs are mature. So if we were to draw a graph here with the level of lecithin or sphingomyelin on the y-axis and time during pregnancy on the x-axis here, we would see that the level of sphingomyelin in the amniotic fluid is relatively constant throughout the pregnancy. The level of lecithin, however, is relatively flat and then shoots up late in pregnancy when the lungs mature. And when this ratio becomes about 2 to 1, the lungs are mature, and that's at about 35 weeks. Preterm babies who are delivered before the lungs are mature are given steroids, usually beta-methasone, and this is because this stimulates surfactant production in the lungs. And babies that are born prematurely often have great respiratory difficulty, and it's because they don't have enough surfactant. Babies that are born prematurely have a condition called neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. This is also called hyaline membrane disease. It gets the name because hyaline means glass-like, and that's what the alveoli look like. Basically, these children have atelectasis because they were born before their lungs were mature. So they have severe hypoxemia and high levels of carbon dioxide because they have poor ventilation. It's difficult to treat these children because when you administer O2, it all goes to the healthy alveoli. The sick alveoli are collapsed. This is a condition called called intrapulmonary shunting, which I discuss in a little more detail in one of the other modules. So let's talk about some of the risk factors for neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. The first one, obviously, is prematurity. If the baby's born before the lungs are mature, respiratory distress syndrome will occur. The second risk factor is maternal diabetes. Chronically high levels of glucose from the mother can stimulate the baby's pancreas to make lots of insulin, and those high insulin levels will decrease the surfactant production in the fetus. And then the final risk factor is cesarean delivery. When a baby is delivered vaginally, there's compression stress that leads to production of fetal cortisol. And remember, I said cortisol is what stimulates surfactant production. So babies that are born by cesarean section don't get this compression stress, and they can have lower cortisol levels, and this can lead to a reduction in surfactant and increase the risk of the respiratory distress syndrome. Babies who survive the neonatal respiratory distress syndrome can develop a number of complications, and I've listed three of the important ones for you to know on this slide. And what you want to know about these three complications is that they're all related in some way to oxygen. That's what they're likely to ask you about in step one of the boards. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia involves hyperplasia and fibrosis of the airways, and this can occur in babies born prematurely, and it's thought to be related to oxygen toxicity from exposing the premature lungs to high oxygen levels and mechanical ventilation. 
A patent ductus arteriosus can develop in premature babies, and that's because hypoxia keeps the shunt open. And then finally, babies born prematurely can develop what's known as retinopathy of prematurity. In this case, oxygen leads to free radical formation, and that's thought to induce neovascularization of the retina, in other words, abnormal growth of blood vessels. This can lead to vision problems, and it can even lead to retinal detachment and blindness. Okay, now let's talk about the lobes of the lungs. So remember when you're looking at the lungs in a chest x-ray, this is the right side and this is the left side. Even though this is the right side of your body, it's the left side of the patient. So the right lung has three lobes, an upper lobe here, a middle lobe here, and a lower lobe here. The left lung only has two lobes, an upper and a lower lobe. You can think of the middle lobe as being obliterated by the heart, which sits right here. And this is important when talking about lobar pneumonia. So this is a patient with a right lower lobe pneumonia, which you can see right here. It's all filled with white stuff that's infiltrate and bacteria and pus. And you can have lobar pneumonia in the middle or upper lobe on the right side or in either of the lobes on the left. Something you need to know about the lobes of the lung has to do with aspiration. So the right lung is the more common side of aspiration. So when patients vomit and aspirate those contents, or when a child aspirates a peanut or something like that, the right bronchus is wider and it has less of an angle. So in order to get into the left lung, you need to turn a relatively sharp angle. To get into the right lung, it's a more gentle angle and it's easier for liquids and solids to traverse this. So it's a more vertical path to the lung. So just remember that the right lung is the more common site of aspiration. Patients who vomit and get an aspiration pneumonia usually have a right-sided pneumonia. On the step one exam, they will often test you on lung anatomy by asking you what will happen when there is aspiration of a foreign body. For example, children sometimes aspirate peanuts, and on your exam, they may ask you in which part of the lung is that peanut most likely to be found. And this is very easy to answer if you just know two things. First of all is what we described on the last slide, and that is that the right lung is where aspiration typically goes. And then the second thing you need to know is that a foreign body is going to go to the most gravity-dependent or lowest portion of the lung. It will simply be pulled by gravity. So if a child aspirates a peanut in the upright position, then that peanut is going to go to the bottom of the right lung, which is the right inferior lobe lower portion. I've made a drawing of the right lung on the screen here. This is the middle lobe, this is the upper lobe, and this is the lower lobe. So if a child aspirates a foreign body in the upright position, it will simply go to the bottom of the lung, the lowest portion of the inferior lobe. Now, if a child aspirates a foreign body when they are supine or lying flat, then this part of the lung is going to be the most gravity dependent. That means that the foreign body can end up here, which is one of two different places. Sometimes it can end up in the posterior portion, that's this P of the upper lobe, and sometimes it can end up in the superior portion of the inferior lobe, that's this S here. So this is sometimes a point of confusion. Different textbooks will list different sites for where the foreign body ends up when a patient is supine, and that's just because there are two different sections of the right lung that are the most gravity dependent when a patient is supine. To make this even more confusing, this S portion right here is sometimes called the apical portion of the inferior lobe. That's because it forms a point and a point is an apex. So sometimes you'll read in textbooks that when a patient is supine and aspirates a foreign body, it goes to the apex of the inferior lobe. That just means the superior portion of the inferior lobe. But a foreign body can also go to the posterior portion of the upper lobe. They like you to know the relationship of the pulmonary artery to the trachea and bronchi. So this is the pulmonary artery right here, and this is the left pulmonary artery over here, and this is the right pulmonary artery over here. You'll notice that the right pulmonary artery goes anterior to the right bronchus. It's in front of the right bronchus. The left pulmonary artery, on the other hand, goes superiorly to the left bronchus right here. It goes over the top of the left bronchus, and they sometimes ask you about this on your boards. Next, let's talk about the diaphragm. So this is the most important muscle for breathing. When you take in a breath, your diaphragm contracts and both sides go down towards your abdomen to pull air into the lungs. One of the first things I want to discuss is how important structures pass through the diaphragm to the abdomen. There are three major openings that allow thoracic structures to get to the abdomen. The first one is called the caval foramen, and this is where the inferior vena cava passes through the diaphragm. The second opening is the esophageal hiatus, where the esophagus goes through, and then the third opening is the aortic hiatus. Now, if you've looked at the diaphragm in an anatomy lab, you know that it's not entirely flat. Some parts of it are a little bit higher up than other parts of it. So the cable opening, it turns out, is at the level of T8. And as I said before, this is where the inferior vena cava passes through to the abdomen. The esophageal hiatus is at the level of T10, and this is where the esophagus goes through and also the vagus nerve.
And then finally, the aortic hiatus is at the level of T12. And this is where the aorta gets into the abdomen. It's also where the thoracic duct and the azagous vein pass through the diaphragm. The diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerve, and this comes from C3, C4, and C5. And a lot of people remember that C3, C4, and C5 keep the diaphragm alive. When you have irritation to the diaphragm, this means you're going to get referred pain to the shoulder because C3, C4, and C5 also carry shoulder pain fibers, so the body will interpret the diaphragm irritation as shoulder pain. A classic example is gallbladder disease. Many patients who have cholecystitis will have pain in their shoulders. Another example is a lower lung mass. Another thing you can get when the diaphragm is irritated is dyspnea because you can't effectively contract the muscle to breathe and you can also get hiccups from irritation of the diaphragm. If there's damage to the phrenic nerve, this will cause the diaphragm to elevate on the side with the nerve and this can cause dyspnea. So patients who have thoracic or cardiac surgery often have phrenic nerve damage during the operation. When they recover from the surgery, they find that they're short of breath. And the reason is because on one side of their body, their diaphragm cannot contract properly. What they have is what's called paradoxical movement. So the affected side moves up with inspiration. Normally your diaphragm should move down on both sides when you breathe in, but if one side is damaged, the other side will move down and it will push the affected side up. This is called paradoxical movement. You can actually see this under a fluoroscope. You ask the patient to sniff, it's called a sniff test, and you will see paradoxical movement. One side will go down and the other side will go up. And this is the way you can diagnose phrenic nerve damage in a patient who has dyspnea. Now let's talk about the muscles you use to breathe. So when you're not thinking about breathing and you're just letting air flow in and out of your lungs, you're not inhaling deeply or pushing air out vigorously, this is called quiet respiration. And quiet respiration is done entirely by the diaphragm. It draws air into your lungs and then it relaxes and the air just passively flows out in a quiet breath. Contrast that with exercise breathing. When you exercise, you want to vigorously inhale to draw in as much air as possible, and then you want to forcefully exhale to get that air out and allow another breath to come in. So for inspiration, you're going to use extra muscles in the neck. These are muscles like the scalenes, which raise the ribs, and the sternocleidomastoids, which raise the sternum. And if you just take a deep breath right now, you'll see that your shoulders go up slightly, and that's because you're contracting those muscles in your neck. And that's an easy way to remember that the neck muscles help you inspire with exercise. When you exercise and you exhale, you add muscles from the abdomen. And if you blow out a breath vigorously right now, you'll feel your abdomen contract. And that's an easy way to remember that the abdomen's involved in exercise exhalation. These are muscles like the rectus muscles, the internal and external obliques, the transverse abdominis, and also the internal intercostals. And sometimes in the hospital, you'll hear people say that the patient is using accessory muscles to breathe. What they mean is that when you watch them breathe, you can see them contracting their neck muscles and their abdomen. And it's a sign of respiratory distress. That patient is using extra muscles to get air in and out of the lungs because quiet breathing is insufficient given that they have a sick lung condition. And that concludes our module on pulmonary anatomy.